I was just exploring. And because I didn't know that there was a vet tech school, like I didn't even know the vet tech school was a thing. It's the coolest thing in the whole world to get to get paid to save animals <laughs> and to like teach people about animals and to, um, you know, spread good words about animals and how to care for them. And, and to get to share that love with other people is such an amazing thing. And that's why I'm here now. I am so excited to share with you this episode with Megan Parks, a registered veterinary technician from Mission Veterinary Partners. Now, Megan has a beautiful story, and that's how we start this episode. She talks about her story and her career journey. And at one point, part of her career journey very recently, she noticed that we have a retention problem in veterinary medicine. So where are the veterinary technicians going? Well, she decided to sit down and do a survey and find out exactly why they are leaving either the practices or veterinary medicine in general. And the answers may surprise you. She actually got a huge response of over 800 people. And we learn a lot through what they say. And that is at the end of the episode and Megan really breaks down a lot of those things. So it's an amazing episode and here is Megan Parks. We get to start with something that we didn't touch on yesterday and that is really going back into your story on the very beginning on when did you know that you even wanted to get into veterinary medicine? Well, you know, like pretty much every other person in vet med I've always loved animals, but I think something that's a little different with me uh, is that I never had animals growing up. So my parents did not like animals. (laughs) (laughs) They're like the opposite of me. And so I got to go out to my grandparents' farms. Um, So one of them had a lot of animals, the other one didn't. And I spent a lot of time catching frogs and um, stray animals. And, you know, one time I found a stray beagle in my neighborhood growing up and I tied it to our crab apple tree in the backyard, uh, in Kansas city. And I thought my parents were just like, not going to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I even like walked down the street to, um, I think that they were called Osco drugs. Do you remember those? I don't no. know. Um, so there was like a Osco drug store, uh, down the street from us. And so I walked down there got like dog food and everything. Like I used my own money. Hmm. Like I was determined that I was going to keep this dog and, um, they, they, they found it. So, (laughs) and I'm pretty sure it had a home. Um, so animal control came and got it. And then, um, I would find like injured, uh, pigeons and just every, I still, that still happens to me, but, uh, I knew that I wanted, it's not that I even wanted to be in a career with, um, animals. Um, I just loved them. You know, I don't think that it was ever actually introduced to me that I could work with animals or be a veterinarian. I don't think that that was ever on my radar, um, which I'm not a veterinarian, right. But I, it wasn't even really talked about. And, uh, when I, you know, went to college, I actually was going to be an artist. Uh, so I went to school for art originally and I started meeting local artists and things like that for, you know, our, our shows. Cause like we would put on our own shows as students in college and, uh, they were all very poor and that really scared me, uh, because, you know, the challenge of not getting a gig or, you know, having to work two jobs and, and stuff like that, which I did for a long time anyways, but Uh, it kind of scared me. So I changed, you know, my direction and I was kind of just figuring out what I wanted to do. And, you know, at this point I was 21. No, I wasn't quite 21. I was thinking, I think it was 18 or 19 years old. And a friend of mine said, Hey, I was working at an Outback Steakhouse as a server. I worked there for five years um, in college. And I I said, Hey, you know, I don't know what I want to do with my life. And they're like, my my uh, vet is hiring for a vet assistant. Maybe you should go like try that out, you know, just like part-time. And so I did and they hired me and I worked there for three years. And then I went to school and, you know, I learned what being a vet tech was because I truly just didn't, I didn't know. And had I not gotten that job, you know, I think back on that moment so often because, because now I'm in recruiting, right? (laughs) And I deal with a lot of hiring managers that don't want to take anybody without experience. And 
had they not hired me, I probably would have never gone to tech school because I got real lucky and a technician who I'm still very good friends with to this day, her name's Shannon. Um, she trained me and she was in school at the time. She's like one of the most passionate technicians that I've ever met. And she taught me so much before I even went to school um, because I just was a sponge, you know, I just thought it was so fascinating and I kind of just fell into it. So I don't have, I guess, maybe the traditional, like I loved animals and it's always what I wanted to do. I've always loved animals, but I didn't know it was an actual profession. And that kind of actually goes into (laughs) where have all the vet techs gone? Because again, going back to that time where I walked into that hospital and they hired me, had they not given me that chance, you know, I think back to that all the time, where would I be? You know, what would I have done? Would I have tried to get a job at another hospital? Because like that really wasn't ever my intention, you know, to make that a career. I was just exploring. And because I didn't know that there was a vet tech school, like I didn't even know the vet tech school was a thing. And I learned all this. And so it, it just was really eye opening. And I, I like to tell that story to um, hiring managers because, you know, a lot of times they're just very hesitant to take on people um, that are not from our industry or they want a year of experience or things like that. Unfortunately, you know, the pool is becoming smaller and smaller and we're going to have to start opening those doors and those arms again to being able to, um, foster people like that, because had it not been for Eagle Animal Hospital and and little, little Kansas city, you know, I, I don't think that I would have ever started my career. Uh, within VetMed. So, you know, it's like, you never know who's going to walk through the door and we should really be focusing on personality and the kind of person they are, as opposed to their technical skills. Cause you can teach anybody to draw blood. You can teach anybody to take a history or a TPR, but you can't always teach someone how to be empathetic or kind or friendly or positive. You know, those are not, those sometimes are like innate traits that we have to look for for individuals. And I feel like if everybody hired based on those traits, we'd probably be, you know, in a better, a better situation right now. Right. Um, and, and we're more open, like more open to the possibility and training and mentorship, because I think now, nowadays, like there's so many people, you know, we're like in this perfect storm of uh, these the smaller hospitals not being able to do that because they simply just do not have the staff that's willing to do it. You know, it's not mm-hmm. about having the capacity to, it's about having the capacity and wanting to do it because there's there's a lot of unpaid, you know, responsibilities that technicians take on. And one of those is training. And so if they're not going to get, you know, extra compensation for training a new person, they really aren't into it. You know, why would they? It's not incentivized and it's not part of their job, right? So really they have no reason to want to train that person. And so I think, you know, we have a lot of work to do, but one thing that I think would be great is if, you know, every hospital, even the smaller ones had a designated person. And if they just gave them a shift differential, you know, two or three bucks an hour on top of what they normally make. We've done that at a hospital uh, in Minnesota and it was a huge hit. So, um, and that's an opportunity right there that small animal hospitals can take to incentivize incentivize their staff and also be able to hire on, you know, people that may want to get into vet med or, you know, they want to go to vet tech school, but they don't have any experience. Or it's the opposite. Like some technicians will graduate from school and all they have is their externship. Because maybe they couldn't afford to work at an animal hospital, truthfully, because they couldn't afford to just work at an animal hospital. So maybe they were working at like, you know, their first career choice or something like that. Like maybe it's their second career. Well, if they come out of school and they don't have any experience, nobody wants to hire them either because they might have the credentials, but they don't have the experience. Like I've had I've had hiring managers turn down candidates because they don't have any experience. (laughs) So, yeah, well, I mean, even for those who went on to. Um, you know, become veterinarians. Most of us started as kennel hands with zero experience. We we were clean, uh, cleaning ke- kennels and um, the floors. I remember taking labels off cans. <laughs> I mean, that's where we all start. Um, so we think it is important to to let those people in and start getting experience. Now, just based off the conversation that we've had previously, I'm interested that you worked as a an assistant for three years, and then you decided to go to vet tech school. So Um, I, so I worked as an assistant. Um, I was, I worked there for a year before I went to tech school. So, um, uh, so I, I was, but I was still a VA. 
um, while I was in school. So I worked right. as a VA, but I was a vet assistant for a year. Well, my like, question technically for three years because I didn't have my you were still in school, right? Um, well, my question was, why did you decide to go to vet tech school? Mm, yeah. So, uh, great question. I am, uh, you know, typical Midwestern girl, but I have I have a little bit of a so I, I have a, a more of a difference. so. Growing up, um, we were fairly poor and um, I didn't uh, have a lot of access to, you know, information about going to school and things like that. And my family is not really um, into uh, education. I know that that sounds funny, but um, they're they're blue collar. So my dad is an electrician, uh, my mom is a stay-at-home mom and um, like sold, uh, if you know what Discovery Toys are. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, so she did that um, my entire childhood, and I actually got pregnant when I was 16, and I placed the baby for adoption right after my 17th birthday. And wow. so you can imagine what kind of a, a wrench that throws into a young person's life. And so school was the last thing <laughs> on my mind. I've always been a great student. Uh, you know, I, Learning comes easy to me. I love it. Uh, so I still graduated with honors and, and all of that good stuff, but I didn't know what I wanted to do because I was really lost. I was lost in grief. Um, I had a lot of uh, shame and grief and trauma and just, you know, I did not have a great support system that understood what I was going through because a lot of people don't, you know, it's becoming a birth mom and placing a baby for adoption is something that is finally getting talked about more often, but it was really, really, really traumatic. Uh, it was, you know, kind of a, uh, my family is very religious. And so it was this like horrible, like, oh gosh, you know, our, our daughter is, you know, not who we thought she was kind of situation. I just was lost. I was so lost. And so when I went to college, it was because I felt like I needed to do something with my life and I didn't know what it was. Um, I've always, you know, from the time I left my parents' house and moved out, I've had animals, you know, I've had pets and, and everything. Um, and I knew that I loved it, but I wasn't sure like what to do with that. Right. And when I met Shannon Quinn, I, I, I mean, I'm to be totally transparent. Um, she was just this ball of like encouragement and just so much. She made the job so fun. And she's, I, I'm happy to report she's actually back at that practice. She left for several years, but she's back working with that same group. Um, they're a great group of people and technicians. I know um, several people that work there and they're just, they have this amazing culture of, you know, supporting each other and making work fun. And she was having so much fun and she made it, she just made it magical almost, you know, and um, she would just teach me all of these awesome things. And I was such a sponge and it was so cool to have somebody that wanted to teach me all of this cool stuff. You know, like it felt like I mattered and I don't think it was like, you know, right away that I wanted to go to tech school. It took a little bit, but the more she taught me and the more I learned and, and I was good at these things, I found out, you know, I was like, wow, like I'm learning this and I can do this. This is so neat. I think that's when I finally decided this is, this is it. This is the path. I'm so good at it. This is a great place. Um, I'm still very good friends with the people that work there. Uh, I actually ended up working there for three years. I left uh, to go into emergency and specialty. So it wasn't, you know, I, I wanted to leave there. It was, I wanted to do more. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to learn more. And I wanted to do ER and, you know, have that like adrenaline um, because I loved it so much. And so and if anybody's met me, I don't do anything you know, like half ass, it's, it's like, it's the whole ass or nothing, you know? Um, <laughs> so that's, that's why, I mean, I really don't have a cool answer. It's really, it was the influence of that one person. And so, you know, whenever anybody's out there, you know, thinking that they're not going to make a huge difference, you can, you can make a huge difference. Shannon changed the trajectory of my entire life and my career. So I have her to thank for that. I mean, it was really because of her and that clinic. Like, I mean, I didn't know 
I, and so my, because my parents were into school, they still aren't like, like, for example, <laughs> this is, if they ever listen to this, they're going to be like, Egan. but they, uh, like my sister got her MBA recently. Right. Um, and they just did not get it. They're like, why would you go back to school and spend more money on school? <laughs> so I think, um, you know, the veterinarian option I think was always there, but I, I didn't so much care about the vet stuff. No, no offense, Megan, but I, <laughs> I didn't really care about diagnosing. I wanted to do the cool stuff. I wanted to do the hands-on stuff. You know, I wanted to intubate animals and place catheters and like, you know, sit with an animal while we give it an infusion. And, you know, I wanted to do all of those things and not that the, what the vets were doing wasn't fantastic. And all of those people are amazing, but I wanted to do the tech stuff for sure. Like, I'm like, this is my jam. So it was really just like the people that I've met. And I think that vet school was a little intimidating too, because I, you know, I had been in school and gotten a lot of my prereqs out of the way. You know, I was in college when I, I was in college for three years before I decided to do the tech program. And so, you know, the school that I was going to was great, but I think I was a little nervous that, you know, vet school is really expensive. And, you know, I was already at, at the point that I, let's see, I started school, I think, in vet tech school when I was 19. And so I turned 21 while I was in school. And I think that I was already so far, you know, I mean, 19 isn't that old, but when you think about vet, vet school, I would have had to go back and do like a lot of, a lot more classes. And um, it just seemed like it was so far, you know, far away from me. Um, and tech school was right in my backyard. You know, the school that Shannon was going to sounded so cool because they have live animals there. Um, (laughs) they do large animal, like, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but the school I went to does have a 98% pass rate for their students on the VTNE. They're just a phenomenal facility. It's Maple Woods Veterinary Technology. It's um, part of a community college here in Kansas City. It's just the education that I got there is probably. Like, I mean, it, it, it com- uncomparable to anything else. I, it's just, we had live animals there every semester. So we would um, do everything with the shelter animals that we would get them from local shelters. And we would keep, um, I think there's like 18 dogs and 18 cats or something around there. Um, and so we got to have our own animals and each person would be an advocate for an animal and then they adopt them out at the end of the semester. I mean, you know, I know, I know vet school is, I think kind of similar, like some schools have that similar setup, uh, but it was just so awesome to be able to have that hands-on education. And I mean, we had so much fun in school. Like I joke about it, but I'm like, if I, if somebody could pay me to go back to school, like for that program for two years, I would totally do it. (laughs) Well, often they are looking for teachers, so you never know. Uh, You just gave them great marketing. So (laughs) I know, I mean, Maple Woods, Vet Tech, man, they're awesome. They're amazing. But yeah, so that's kind of my story and and, uh, how I ended up in Vet Med. And, you know, I think it was kind of, you know, serendipitous because because of like the pain and the suffering that I had gone through with my adoption, which I'm happy to report, uh, she is part of a huge part of my life. Um, her name's Regan, my, my daughter who I placed and she, I don't want to show like a bad picture of her. She's, she'll be mad at me, but, um, <laughs> so I have, I have three daughters now and Regan is now a big part of my life. So these are my other daughters, uh, oh. several years ago, but, um, we, we met again when she was uh, 14, but at the time, um, I didn't have access to her and, you know, the grief that I felt, I didn't deal with it for a very long time. Um, it took me a long time to get into therapy and really work through all of that. But, um, I think that it was a healing moment for me because I felt so lost. And when I started working at that clinic and Shannon took me under her wing and just taught me all this stuff, I like finally felt like I belonged somewhere. Does that make sense? So like I found my people and that was so powerful for me and I can't, I'm not going to start crying, but, uh, you know, had it not been for that, I don't know where, I truly don't know where I would have ended up. You know, it's just, I think back to that moment all the time and I'm just so, so, so grateful for everyone that I've ran into. And it, and it, it just goes to show like how amazing this industry is Mm -hmm. like, it's the coolest thing in the whole world to get to get paid 
to save animals <laughs> and to like teach people about animals and to, um, you know, spread good words about animals and how to care for them. And, um, you know, just, uh, and to get to share that love with other people is such an amazing thing. And that's why I'm here now. That's why I'm here with you today is because I think this is the coolest place. You know, I had a, I had a mentor, um, who is an, who unfortunately passed away from suicide. Uh, but he told me one time, he would joke and everybody that knows him, his name is Jeff Dennis. Uh, Jeff would tell us uh, that he's never taking a vacation because work is his vacation. He would joke with us, but he was being serious. And I really, truly believe that he loved what he did so much that it was never a job to him. And, you know, it, he gave so much of himself to this. And I think back to something that he told me a long time ago is that he, uh, he was like, you know, Megan, this, and he said the same thing. He's like, isn't this the coolest job ever? Like we get paid, people pay us to help their animals. And it's so simple, but if you really think about that and like, you know, keep that in your mind while you're working or while you're maybe doing something that's unpleasant. Um, I always go back to that because even though it's hard and it's stressful and it can be really heavy on our hearts sometimes, it's still the coolest job ever. I mean, animals are the coolest. And I am like, just every day, I'm like so grateful that I get to wake up and I like sometimes have to pinch myself. I'm like, this is like the coolest career ever. So that's how I feel about it. Uh, but it, it really did. I think sometimes it has saved my life in certain ways just because like I found that sense of belonging here and other people that love animals. It's awesome. Yeah. And I think that speaks to maybe to why you have such a heart to give back to the profession and to help others uh, who are technicians. Um, and before we get to that part, because I want to make yeah. sure we have plenty of time for that. Um, you also have done a lot of different things as a, a veterinary technician. So I, I would love to be able to, to highlight some of the different opportunities you've had along your career journey. So what are some of the different uh, roles, positions, and things yes. as you got excited and wanted more? What, what were some of those more things? Well, uh, you know, I worked at the ER at Mission MedVet um, for several years, and I actually ended up working in ophthalmology. So when I finally graduated in 2000, it was 2011, I graduated and uh, became an RVT and I worked in optho full time. And then I decided I want to leave Kansas City and go adventure somewhere else. So I moved to Arizona and for love. <laughs> um, for love. Uh, well, I thought it was love, but um, I moved to Arizona for a boy. And uh, when I got there, I had the opportunity, uh, which is a whole other like conversation in itself, to acquire um, a small doggy daycare and run it. And so I was the owner and manager of this small doggy daycare. And then I worked for I Care for Animals. Uh, and I worked for them the entire time I was down there. I moved back to Kansas City in 2014. So uh, it was so 2011 to 2014. Um, I was working I Care for Animals and running my doggy daycare. Uh, lots of lessons learned. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like I remember my, <laughs> when I ran payroll for the first time, um, I like almost overdrafted my business account and I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I think I, I, every I, entrepreneur has that moment. You're fine. I know. <laughs> <laughs> like they made it seem so easy but it's not. Uh, so I learned a ton, you know, managing my own business. Like that was, it was so much fun. Like doggy daycare, super fun business. Um, but be prepared to work lots of weekends and, and even overnights and holidays. Uh, so, you know, it got kind of old pretty quick because it was so small. Like I really had to work there. So it wasn't like I could just like manage it from afar. So I was really busy. I had my first, or uh, you know, Evelyn, so my second daughter there. Uh, and it was really tough being so far from home. Uh, and I'm like, I really miss home. And I was flying home all the time. <laughs> and like flying home so much, I was getting like several free flights a year. And I just decided, you know, I, I really need to come back to Kansas City. So um, I didn't know what I was going to do with my doggy daycare. I like thought 
I was just going to kind of close it because um, I just, you know, I like selling a business is, you know, not impossible, but it can be a lot of work. And um, I just really wasn't sure if I really wanted to go down that route. And I was renting my space and the managers that I had there, I sat them down and I was like, Hey, like, this is what I'm going to do. You know, um, I don't know what I'm going to do business. And they actually offered to purchase it from me. And that's what we did. So uh, it's still in existence. It's dog days, doggy daycare and, and boarding in Tempe, Arizona. So, you know, my hope is that they will eventually open a second location, but um, it's a cage-free daycare. It was so, it was so much fun. And then uh, I care uh, is, you know, a phenomenal company. They didn't have a full-time position when I moved back to Kansas city. It's like, okay, well, what am I going to do? So I took a month uh, which was fantastic uh, to just kind of figure out what I was going to do. And a friend of mine worked at the local Blue Pearl Emergency Center, and they were looking for a daytime ER tech. And I was like, oh, well, that sounds pretty good. So I worked there uh, for a while, um, for, for a long while. And I eventually became their, uh, they, it, the position is called the relations representative, but I was the bridge between primary care hospitals and the referring practices. And then I, I did, um, I organized and executed all of their continuing education events every year for technicians. And I did have a counterpart that worked with me. So I had a partner and she helped a lot more with like the DVM side of things because, you know, I love tech stuff. So uh, we would do like a day long symposium every year for technicians. It was called Heat Stroke. And then uh, oh, yeah. we had a day long CE called Frostbite. Uh, so there's frostbite for DVMs and heat stroke for technicians. And we would put it on for free through Blue Pearl every year. Uh, they don't do it anymore. I think the last year that they did it was the year I did it um, in 2018. Um, I think I was the last spoke. year. That That's no funny. Way. I, I spoke at the Blue Pearl frostbite in, I think it was Kansas City. Yeah. Yeah. When? Uh, 2017? Eight. No way. What did you speak on? Uh, <laughs> I, I would have been there. I would have been there. I think it was, uh, it was either, I think it was emergency nutrition or like so critical cool. care nutrition. Yeah. yeah. It was amazing. either 2017 so or 2018. Well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would have been there. Yeah. I would have been there. So that's really crazy. Yeah. We had a lot of fun putting those on. Um, so you probably dealt with Micah um, on that one, but uh, so much fun. Um, and I love that job, but then, uh, I had, um, Jeff, uh, passed away. It was just, it was re really rough. I mean, for the whole entire community, cause he was just such a, um, well, you probably met Jeff then. If it mm -hmm. was 2017, he would have still been with Blue Pearl. So I bet you've, you actually met him. I bet. Oh, I don't know. Wow he was the one that started frostbite. So, uh, he like created that event. Like, I mean, he, he ran that, but when he committed suicide, it was just really tough. Cause my job was to go to the primary care hospitals. And so it was, it's was just, it's a tight knit community here and I needed something different. So I took a practice management position, um, for a little while and that didn't last very long. Um, and then, uh, I worked for Behringer Ingelheim, uh, which great company. Oh my gosh. I have nothing but great things to say about VI. Like they're just good people. Um, so, you know, kudos for them for, uh, just being amazing. They just, they have an awesome HR department. Like they're just great, solid company that takes care of its people. And that was a desk job and it was for pharmaceuticals. You know, I mean, not that it's not fascinating. I didn't, I learned everything I could possibly learn about vet med. I mean, ask me anything. <laughs> I can tell you. Um, and I learned everything I possibly could about every other one of their products. Um, I know all about, you know, uh, their, their studies and, and, and fun stuff. So I learned a ton. That's what really was exciting. But, you know, you learn everything about the portfolio and then you're just like, okay, I'm just going to answer questions all day, every day. And it was so much fun um, at the beginning. But I think that um, just the monotony of, of the job and we took calls from consumers as well. So it was just really tough uh, because... <laughs> Um, you know, talking with, um, with consumers is, uh, it's fun, um, when they are receptive to the information that you have to give. <laughs> so if calling just event. Yeah. Not yeah. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, I had, I had a good time on that team. Um, great team that they have there. Uh, but I got an opportunity to go lead, um, 
uh, the Humane Society of Greater Kansas City last year. And it was phenomenal, super busy. I worked a ton, but it was awesome. I turned that um, organization uh, on the right path and uh, did a, a lot of internal work there. They just celebrated a million dollars for the first time in the history of the organization and their bank wow. account. Um, so I still do volunteer work for them. And then, um, the reason that I came to MVP was because my good friend called me up and said, Hey, like, do you want to come do this? So that's, that's my whole journey in a nutshell, but I've gotten to do like the coolest stuff. I mean, I've gotten to work on Indian bears at the world wildlife zoo in Phoenix with eye care because they would do all of their mm-hmm. like exotic stuff pro bono, um, Blue Pearl here did all of the exotic stuff for the Kansas City Zoo pro bono. Um, And so like I've seen like cheetahs and, you know, like I'm sure that you've seen a lot of cool stuff too. But, um, you know, being a technician in this uh, place, like, I mean, I've gotten to just do things. I honestly, I couldn't probably have dreamed how cool some of the experiences have been that I've, that I've gotten to be a part of. And, you know, I, I certainly never thought that I would be in charge of a day long symposium of, you know, 300 technicians coming to it. Uh, so I've, I've gotten to do a lot of stuff and I'm incredibly grateful for every single opportunity that I've had. And I just want to keep going. So uh, <laughs> and you are. And yeah. so now we come to Mission Veterinary Partners and yeah. you are part of the team that helps recruiting talent. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you were telling me yesterday that through this job, you kind of noticed some things. And so you decided to send out a survey. So do you mind sharing that story? Yeah. Again? So I just started noticing that a lot of people had, um, I don't think I even told you this, but uh, we didn't really go too far into it. So I'm excited to tell you about how this all came to fruition. So I noticed a lot of resumes with like past vet tech experience, right? And they're not doing vet tech anymore. And um, we're having trouble hiring at a lot of hospitals. I mean, this is not just MVP, you know, this is nationwide, right? There's a huge shortage I feel like this kind of started many years ago. Uh, I think people were starting to kind of, you know, COVID hit and and it just like created this perfect storm. You know, it really made people evaluate, what am I doing with my life? I think that anybody that was on the fence was finally just like, all right, like I'm just going to go on the other side and find, you know, greener pastures or or whatever it was. Um, and so they started leaving and and we just had this like, and we still have, I mean, extreme holes in certain ge- geographies where, you know, there's people there, but we can't find any licensed technicians. So, you know, I, I had been asked by somebody and several people about like why I left practice. And so um, this is the exact situation that happened. I started writing an email to my leadership and about why I left practice and to see if it would help them, you know, kind of come up with anything that we could do to help bring people back. Right. So that's what I'm trying to do is, is bring the people back into the field, but also get the word out there that being a vet tech is awesome and you can go to school for it. And, um, and, and there's opportunity out here. Right. Uh, so I was writing this letter, you know, like about why I left practice. And then I'm like, "Eh, you know, I don't know if this is going to make a difference. And then I went for a drive and because, you know, you come up with some amazing ideas. Have you ever read uh, A Minute to Think? Ooh, no. I highly recommend. Great book. A Minute to Think. Um, my mentor and manager, Eden Stefan, uh, who run, runs our TA team, she had recommended it to me because I, you know, I'm, I'm always going, right? Like I'm like 20 <laughs> miles an hour all the time. Um, so uh, she's like, you know, you need to learn how to like disengage because when your mind is free and you're not so bogged down by all this, you know, stuff, you can come up with really cool ideas. So I went for a drive um, to get some white space time and I was like, why do they care why I left? Why don't I just ask everybody else? And so I called a couple of friends to make sure it was like a solid idea. I'm like, this isn't silly, right? People are going to respond to me. They're like, no, I think it's a great idea. You should do it. So I released the survey, where have all the vet techs gone? And it was just a Google form. I just text, I literally texted it to some people <laughs> and then just like put it on Facebook, put it on LinkedIn. 
And uh, within 30 days, I had over 900 responses to their survey about why they, why people have left the field. Um, and so the, the primary purpose for the survey was to find out why they left and to find out what were the main causes they left and in, in hopes of uncovering what we need to do as a profession to bring them back or create a more sustainable career choice, right? How can we do that? How can we stop these people from leaving vet med? And so we had, you know, this crazy overwhelming response. Uh, I didn't know what to do with this. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what to do with all this. Like, what should I do? So um, I, I started talking with some friends about the results and I'm like, I need to get these out in front of people, right? Uh, so my good friend, uh, Heather Kovite, actually, she's a, an internist um, that I've known for many years. We met at Blue Pearl. Um, and we're, we're good friends. She's a mentor of mine. And she's like, let's get you in front of somebody. So I got to present the data to the vet partners group um, in Portland this, this fall. And um, I've created, you know, a presentation and uh, kind of a summary, a synopsis thing. I'll send that over to you so that you have it about what the survey revealed. And, you know, it revealed that, uh, you know, 100%, like I was telling you yesterday, 100% of the respondents are going to leave vet med or have. So nobody responded with, no, I'm going to stay. This is so great, which, you know, it's a little bit of a biased crowd, right? Like I, I, I was asking people the that title. left to take it, right? <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so you know, to give for what it's worth, but 15% uh, of the respondents, which is 135 people said, I'm still in practice, but in the next year I'm planning on going. Like I'm done with this. Wow. Uh, and the primary causes, number one was money. So money and low wages. And number two was toxic work environment, um, poor leadership, and just lack of you know opportunities. And then the third one was uh, really like it was a mixture of uh, culture and um, just the lack the lack of opportunity, you know, to be able to do anything else in practice. Mm. And so I kept digging, and the data showed that forty six percent of the people responded yes when I asked them if they would come back if we fixed everything. So I said, if we fix this, would you come back? That's 46% of these people. Mm. So that's 46% of a very large group of technicians. And I had like a sprinkling of DVMs and practice managers, past practice managers or practice managers that are now like an industry respond as well. Uh, but they were a really small percentage. So um, over 800 of them were technicians or reported that they were technicians that answered the survey. Um, 543 of them reported that they were, um, or it's 530 something of them were credential technicians. So a, a fairly great sampling um, of people that have left. And it was surprising to me, like the majority of them, I asked them like how long they were in practice before they left. And the majority, the average was eight years. So on top of that, only 135 people were in practice, 260 some of them were still in the industry. So they worked like in pharmaceutical or like, you know, whatever it was that they were doing. And then the other have completely left the field. So they literally, after eight years of dedicated service or more, like some of these technicians have worked in practice 10 plus years. They were like, you know what? I just can't do this anymore. And just went off and went to school like got different degrees, like spent more money on education just to leave the veterinary field because they felt like they didn't have any other option. And it had scarred them so badly that they didn't want to be a part of this anymore. And so I think like it was really heavy when I was reading through, like people could leave comments. I mean, tons of these people were like, I'm so glad that you're asking this question. Thank you for asking this question because no one else has asked it. And I think that they feel very alone and isolated because, you know, that is that is the norm that we've created as an industry for technicians. We have not created a sustainable place for us to work. It's really, it, it, if it wasn't clear for me before, it's even more clear now that we have to change, right? And we have to do something to improve the sustainability of this career, it's the best career ever. You know, like, I don't know a lot of technicians that have retired from this profession. Do you? No. No. But you see veterinarians, right? Like veterinarians. So so we have part of it right. We have part of it right. We need to get the other part right. <laughs> 
Well, and veterinarians can't last long without veterinary technicians. And, you know, we've already had that conversation that <laughs> um, vet techs we know run the show. So <laughs> I mean, well, they, you know, they keep things going. Yeah, they keep things going. Um, but our industry has decided and not decided like as a whole, and they weren't like, we're expendable, but we have not chosen to put value on a veterinary technician profession. I mean, it's very obvious to me. Um, and I feel like anybody, and I, it's just, it's kind of like a taboo subject, you know, like, um, the people that, um, hold the money don't want to give up their money. Um, and I get it, you know, I get that they want to have a profit, but when we have record breaking profits, happening from, you know, being reported from consolidators and individual practices, I am really, really finding it hard to figure out, is it that you can't pay them or is it that you don't want to? And I think that that's the difference. You know, that's the conversation that we really need to be having instead of, well, we just can't afford that. Well, that's not true because I know that they can't afford it. So we need to decide as an industry, as a whole, are we going to value this profession? Or is it going to fizzle out and does it need to really um, get to a point where it's the point of no return and we need to figure out something else? Because uh, this year, you know, 14%, that's a huge number, right? That's the amount that the CVTA mega survey results told us that there's a 14% drop in first year enrollments across the board for vet tech schools. And when we're really only graduating like, you know, less than a couple thousand technicians a year, from all these programs, like that's not filling the gap, right? Yeah. So, you well, know, there's there are things that are happening in companies that I think that, you know, they're trying to move in the right direction, but I think that it needs, I think that we're past the point of like, we can give people scholarships to go to school. Like we're past that point. Like that's not going to help. That's not going to fix anything. We need like boots on the ground. We need training programs in hospitals. We need to create opportunity within the hospitals. And, you know, the hospitals that are doing it well, you'll see them, they have um, they have training programs. They have people that are specifically dedicated to onboarding. You know, they care about candidate experience. They, they want that person to know that they're cared about, they're part of a team, and they're here to make a difference. And that's really all that anybody wants. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, right? Like, you want to feel like you're a part of something and that you're making a difference. Exactly. You want to feel valued and part of the bigger purpose, like you said. And, um, you know, I am really excited that we're, we're talking, we're recording this, we're going to share this because I think this is partly a, a call out to everyone listening that we all need to look at where can we be a part of the change. It's going to take us all in our area. And, you know, we talked about there aren't really veterinary technicians who have seats at tables where decisions yeah. are made. And so, you know, th that can be a way for if there are veterinarians who want to know what they can do. We often do have seats at the table and we can often bring people and advocate for the veterinary technicians, bring them to the table when we can. Since we're running out of time, one of the other things we talked about is looking at what we can control. So from your perspective to the veterinary technicians who are listening right now, when you're thinking about what can they control, can you speak to that? What would you recommend that veterinary technicians do right now? So I am a, a longtime lurker on many, many technician boards and, uh, you know, Reddit strings and and everything. So, you know, I, I'm always keeping my finger on the pulse of what's happening out there. There's almost this like victim equality to technicians, right? We're always wanting more, right? We want to get paid more. We want to have more respect. We want a seat at the table. You know, the majority of people, and I feel like you, I think you've said this on several of your podcast episodes, because I, I was listening uh, to one uh, last night and you said something that rang true to me, you know, this profession, or maybe it was one of your guests, but this profession invites a lot of introverts. 
you know, we've got all these people that are really timid and and they're afraid to speak up because of retaliation, um, which does happen. It's very real. You know, if you have a toxic culture, absolutely, you're probably going to find some retaliation um, if you speak up about something that you're seeing that's not right. But I urge them not to be afraid anymore. Take the victim hat off and let's put builder hat back on and let's say it's up to us, right? It's going to be up to us. It always was up to us. Um, I think that we were just fine because we all love what we do, right? We love saving animals. Like, let me do this. But now the landscape is changing. Individuals who are younger coming into vet tech schools, they're not necessarily coming into it for the same reasons that we were. And, you know, they want to live a comfortable life. They want financial stability. And that's something that hasn't happened traditionally in in the vet tech world. So um, I would ask these technicians to really stand up and say, I'm not like, this is not okay. And if you're making a low wage and you have for years and you are credentialed technician and you know your worth, I urge you to ask for more and really push that envelope because the reality of the situation is this industry cannot afford not to have us. Instead of saying, oh, well, you know, like the rest of the technicians only get paid $20 an hour. So like, I don't feel right asking for a raise or I don't feel right going into an organization and asking for $25 an hour. My my thing against that is you can't not afford to do that right now. We need to be, we as a profession need to say, this is the standard. And I asked people on the survey, I said, how much should a tech coming out of school make? And they said $25 an hour. And they all agreed 24 to $25 an hour is a acceptable wage for someone that is trained, educated, and credentialed. And I think that's more than fair as well. Um, I do also think that if any business owners or um, you know, leaders are listening, making sure to foster that environment of belonging because that can seriously make or break an entire team. And if you're struggling with culture issues right now, the, the most likely culprit is that your people are feeling lost or like they don't belong and they're not appreciated. And, you know, pizza parties go, uh, you know, about this far, um, but a $5 raise can go this far. And, you know, I think um, something that you said yesterday uh, really stuck with me today too. And I was thinking about this all day and I'm like, you know, um, I feel like the abundance mindset has been lost as well, right? We're so worried and knee jerky about, you know, um, profits and EBITDA and, and all these things that absolutely matter. But we cannot chintz out on, you know, a a technician who is trained, like, let's not get cheap uh, when we have a great person. Let's pay them. You know, even if it's $32 an hour, um, I guarantee you that tech is bringing in at minimum, even if they do the bare minimum, $220,000 in revenue a year. I guarantee you, if not more. And, you know, the AVMA, uh, hi, AVMA. Can you do a study on what a technician brings back into practice? Like, I want to know that. I want to know how much are we bringing? How can we evaluate ourselves? And so if there's any techs out there, don't take this stuff burning down. Stand up with me and let's talk about it. You know, and I invite anybody, you know, um, you're welcome to give my personal, uh, you know, information out. I'm happy to coach technicians on how to have that conversation. Um, We need to have more business-minded classes in our continuing education product, you know, in, in the, the tracks that we have for fetch and things like that, technicians need to know how money works so that we can advocate for this profession so that we can say, Hey, like we know that this is worth investing in. It's worth investing in me. They just have to advocate for it. Instead of leaving, you know, I, I have technicians that are like, you know, I'm just done with this. I can't fight anymore. Well, instead of leaving, let's try to figure it out leave your job. There's jobs everywhere right now. You know, find a clinic that does value you. If you're stuck in a position, you've been there forever. Like I get all the reasons for staying, but now is the time. Now is the time that we're going to find out who is taking care of their technicians and who is not. And I think that that's going to be a big tell in the next couple of years when, you know, things kind of start to slow down for the consolidators and, and groups really start to settle and age and, and mature. I think that we're really going to see some exciting stuff because, you know, this is, this is one conversation, but you bet your butt I've started a lot others. You know, I I've gotten in front of people and said, we need to do something about this and we need to pay these people. So, you know, if I can do it, 
anybody can, right? We just had to start the conversation. And if they're not going to invite you to the table, then you invite yourself and, you know, ask for equity. If they can't give you a raise, ask for equity, ask for stock options, ask for more in retirement, you know, whatever it is, we need to be taken care of. And it's time for us to say so. And, you know, and ask your veterinarians to advocate for you. Because really, at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to get us in the door, right? And that's the only reason I'm here today. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to call you Dr. Sprinkle, like so bad, because (laughs) I think it's the most amazing name ever. Um, I think we need to do all of that, right? Like we need to inspire each other. We need to also stop with the bashing on these boards. (laughs) It is like just riddled with like, I would never, I asked on the survey, would you recommend this profession to a family member? Like, how likely are you? And you can guess what the answer was. It was almost a resounding, no, don't. And that is the wrong attitude. We need to be telling people to come back in to vet med, like, please come. We need, we need great leaders. We need more leaders. And so, you know, leaders are not born they are created. And I think that there's a leader literally in every single person. And it's about finding that strength and that bravery to come out of your shell and say, Hey, I'm going to stand up for myself and do it tactfully. You know, yes. <laughs> a lot of these, a lot of these texts are, you know, Oh, you know, super, you know, just like they fly off the handle or maybe they, they have unresolved issues about how to um, approach conflict, you know, do your research first. We have the internet now. Um, look up, you know, different feedback styles about how to give feedback and and the most effective way to bring things to the table. Because like, there's just so much information out there about this. And that's how I've gotten here. I mean, I've taught myself almost everything I know besides Shannon, you know, my technical skills, but you know, my business skills, I went back to school and I got a business degree. Because I wanted to know, I wanted to understand. And so, you know, I think that others have that capability too. They just don't, they don't see it, right? They don't see the opportunity in front of them. I can see it. And there's going to be so much opportunity in this field in the next few years, like just popping up everywhere. There already is. And it's, you know, it's like this weird place that we're in right now um, where it's a little discombobulated. People are starting to notice. And now that we're, you know, now we've got all eyes on us, right? Like there's a huge tech shortage and it's a conversation. And so we have to be the ones to say, hey, go to tech school. You know, if you have an unregistered technician at, at your practice um, and, and they just don't see the value in it, I urge you, if you're a credential technician, to really make a big stink about it. Make a bigger stink. And we need to stop. And, you know, I just did it. I just said an uncredentialed technician, um, which there are uncredentialed technicians. If you graduate from an AVMA accredited program, you are technically a veterinary technician. But somebody that hasn't gone to school shouldn't be calling themselves a vet tech. Um, you know, a lot of people are, are real weird about that. But at the end of the day, it's very simple. Did you go to school or did you not? And if you did not, you're a vet assistant. That doesn't make you any less valuable to the practice. Your title does not define you you know, and what your, your abilities are. But I think that we, it's time to start recognizing the people that went to school, that spent the money and the time and the effort and and wanted to get that degree. And we need, we need that. Like we need people to start recognizing that. Um, And I think it's coming because I see other companies, you know, they're creating different names for people that are not credentialed technicians. And, and I love that, you know, I love being able to still value them because they're still valuable members of our team. Right. They're just not vet techs and that's okay. Um, and we need to normalize that too. Like, you know, oh, it's just a VA. Like, no, no, our VAs are also, a huge, you know, every person in this practice. So we need to bring it back to this whole like team environment, right? Like we, we work together as a team. So number one, advocate for yourself. Number two, ask for a raise. Number three, if they say no to a raise, um, counter offer them or find a new job. And also ask your veterinarians for help, you know, I like ask them to advocate for you. And if they are not advocates for technicians, but they utilize you every day and, and you work really hard for them, find another, find a vet that will take care of you because they're out there. I mean, look at you, Megan, like there are, there are people out there that really value this profession and we need to be flocking to those leaders and elevating them so that they can also be our voice. Because I think that that's another thing that we can do too, is is, is find the right leadership. Don't stop looking, don't give up, 
you know, get mental health help if you're struggling um, and, and don't give up. Like, I mean, just reinvigorate yourself. Remember why we're doing this. Like we're doing this because of little tiny adorable Aww. animals. I'm babysitting this one. <laughs> um, and you know, I mean, like, this is why, like, this is the coolest thing ever. Like we need to be inviting everyone to come and be a vet tech. I tell everybody that I run into, they're like, Oh, that's, like, that's the coolest job ever. I'm like, it is. And you can do it too. You can come be, be a vet tech. Anybody can be a vet tech. Like you can go to school. It's only two years. Like, you know, the majority of the programs are associates degree programs and it's a great choice for a second career. Um, you know, if you know somebody that's like really burning out, tell them to go to school. I just, I just met somebody the other day that's an RVT. It's her second career. And she was a stay at home mom for like 15 years. And, you know, she's coming back. She went to school. She's an RVT now. She loves it. We need to change our attitude. We need to be more positive as a profession um, and, and just do better and, and, and make other texts. We need to be embracing them. You know, like there's a lot of bashing about other people and things like that. Like we need to keep the eye on the prize, which is a better, more sustainable future for all of us because the people that come behind us, you know, it's not us that, that we really need to be concerned with. It's the future. And when we have that abundance mindset that you were talking about yesterday, you know, instead of like really worrying about the everyday and like if we have a slump in sales or revenue, you know, instead of thinking about right now, what about five years from now, what does this look like? And what opportunities and doors could open if we actually really dug our heels in and said, we are going to do this and we're going to do it together. And we're going to save this profession. We're not going to let it fizzle out. Um, you know, we can, we can do this. I just, I, I don't know how else to get in front of people, but I'm trying like you, you are. <laughs> I'm, I'm keep, keep looking for opportunities to just keep, you know, spreading this and say, Hey, like, we, we have to do better. So, um, so thank you for having me on the show and, and letting me just talk your ear off about <laughs> what I love most in the world. <laughs> this is wonderful. No, thank you for what you're doing because you are doing exactly what you're asking people to do. You are being a voice for change. You're being the example. And I think you said something really, really true. Uh, at least I believe it, that this is the time to know that you are valuable. And so if there were any a time to stand up together and advocate for making this profession as beautiful and wonderful as we know it is, um, I think this is it. So thank you so and, much. Yeah, of course. And you know what? 25 bucks an hour. $25 <laughs> an hour should be the starting wage. And you know, if you are a hiring manager or something like that, keep that number in mind. That is an attainable goal is paying your technicians 25 bucks an hour. It's about $50,000 a year. That is an attainable goal that I think that we can get to. You know, that's easy. an easy, yeah, I, 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 I really, really, truly think that. And um, there's so many like programs for, you know, increased efficiency and things like that. We can make it happen. Like we've got some brilliant minds in this industry and I have no doubt, you know, in the next couple of years, I'm excited. I'm excited. You know, uh, it, as, as dark as it can be sometimes with some of the things that have happened to people, there is nothing but opportunity. So thank you again for awesome. hosting this podcast and having <laughs> me on here. I appreciate it. Well, and I love that that, you know, we're ending on a positive note. So we're, we're going to give you, these are going to end up being rapid fire questions, which is might be hard. So we'll see. <laughs> um, but your wrap up final four questions are, what is something people get wrong about you? I think that they sometimes think I'm like super duper organized. Um, oh. But, and I am on a professional level, uh, but in my personal life, I am a complete disaster. Um, uh, <laughs> like my husband has had to like train me to put like my laundry in the laundry basket. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm not dirty, but I just, I have a creative mind. So yeah. I'm all over the place constantly. So That's I'm just, artist. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not as organized as everybody thinks. <laughs> you don't color in the lines. That's you're an artist. <laughs> I like that. And well, and besides art, although you didn't go into what your favorite type is. So if you want to pull that into this question, fair game. Um, but what is a hidden skill or interest that you have? Oh, oh okay. Uh, lots of them. Um, I am an artist. I uh, do um, traditional uh, fine art type stuff, but my true love is ceramics. 
Um, oh. So I I have I'm an am I call myself an amateur uh, ceramics artist. Um, so I do um, you know some functional art, but uh, a lot of abstract stuff. Um, but I have an entire portfolio. You know, I mean, I've taken uh, advanced cer- ceramics classes. I'm I'm part of the Kansas City Clay Guild. Uh, oh wow! It's, you just pay for. I mean, it sounds way fancier than it is. <laughs> um, they're a great group, but you know, I I can go and like fire my pieces there. So I usually work on them at home. But I've made a lot of mugs. Uh, but I do all kinds of stuff. I've done uh, raku ceramics. So raku firing is where you do. Um, you build a kiln outdoors uh, with like the stuff they essentially make like spaceships out of. Um, oh. <laughs> and it looks like a giant bird cage and you make like a pit and you fire your pieces in the pit with a torch um, that, you know, you fire it all outside and then you take the pieces when they're still glowing red hot. And then you have like different, um, I recommend trash cans. Uh, don't do that at home. Um, but we would have like <laughs> aluminum trash cans and you put combustible material inside the trash cans um, and you use special kinds of glaze on these pieces so that when they go in the trash can, the combustion actually changes the way that they look. And they're very, they're usually like very metallic looking. So you mm. literally take this glowing red hot piece of pottery, you throw it in the trash can. Okay. You close the lid. And then depending on what kind of effect you want, you let it sit in there for a certain amount of time. And then you take it out. If you look up Raku, it's spelled R-A-K-U. Um, you'll, it'll pop up all kinds of just brilliant things. And you'll probably see, recognize some things that you were like, oh, I always wondered like how they made it look like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's literally throwing red hot pieces of clay into trash cans um, with combustible. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that there's probably like a more uh, a fancier way to do Raku, but um, you do it outdoors. Um, I was part of like a summer camp when I was in high school. Um, I was actually pregnant with my daughter at the time, but it was like a, a paid internship that I got to do for the summer and do um, Raku ceramic. I love that. I love, I'm so intrigued to see more. So, um, ooh, so number three is what is something on your bucket list? I want to travel. Um, and so I really, my sister's gotten to go, but I haven't, but I really want to travel to Ireland. I want to go to Ireland so bad. Uh, I think I have roots there. Um, I know I have roots there. We have, um, a lineage that came over on the Mayflower from Ireland. And, um, and so I really want to go there, uh, really, really bad, but, um, I've actually never been out of the country. I'm I'm sorry to say that, but I've never been out of the U- United States. So that's that's a bucket list for me is yeah, getting over to Europe really in any capacity just to see it. You know, yeah. I feel like I just haven't I haven't traveled enough. So I want to go. I want to go see what it's about and find out what the Irish people are like. I've heard just nothing but great things. Like anybody that's ever gone, they're like, "Oh, it's great. They're all so friendly and they're small." Like uh, my sister said, they're small people. I was like, what does that mean? And she's like, they're just, and it's not even, it's, it's just that like, she's like, they're just like smaller statured for, than United, the United States. Like people are just bigger. Over here. <laughs> In many ways. Yes, we are. And I just, I want to go. Right. Correct. Like when, and see the castles. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. That's a big bucket list for me. So. All right. Well, All your right. final question is what is something you are most grateful for? Oh my gosh, everything, right? I wake up every day with a grateful heart. Um, I am so, so, so incredibly grateful for truly like, um, so many things. Like I, I, I love, I truly love my life. It's gotten, it's, it has not always been that way. I'm grateful for all of the people out there that have shown me kindness and mercy whenever I was at my worst. And I'd say like, you know, you truly learn who your best friends are when you have a bad day and you make a mistake. I have just some of the best friends on the planet, uh, including my husband. So I, I, I think I have to put him on the top of the list because he, um, we met in 2014. Um, he has adopted my 10 year old, um, legally and, uh, we have a daughter together. Uh, well, we have two daughters together, but, um, we have a biological daughter as well together. And he, um, just puts up with my constant go, go, go and my ambition and just, you know, just stands beside me and, and levels me out sometimes when I need it. 
So, you know, I'm just so incredibly grateful for my tribe and and my people that I have around me because I, I none of this would be possible if it wasn't for all of them. So this has been the Vet Life Reimagined podcast. Whether you are listening or watching on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Please make sure you are subscribed to catch all these amazing people in our profession. Also, send this episode to someone you think who would appreciate it. Have a recommendation for someone who would be a good guest? Please reach out on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Facebook. There aren't that many Dr. Sprinkles. Until next time, Vet Lifers.